It is really indeed my great honor uh, to come over here to address to you on Taiwan-China relations. But before I started that topic, and I think there should be some words of appreciation to the Americans. Taiwan is enjoying democracy today. Taiwan is enjoying prosperity today. And Taiwan is secure today. And I need to tell you, that is because the United States has been supporting Taiwan. We have been a democracy ever since the 1990s, especially after 1996 when we had the first direct presidential election. And that was the United States who had been encouraging Taiwan to become a democracy. And that's not just what I said. It's embedded in the law passed by the Congress called Taiwan Relations Act. The Taiwan Relations Act specifies that enhancement of the human rights is the U.S. national interest. And based upon the law, the United States has been encouraging the authoritarian rule at the time to make improvement to go toward democracy. And now in Taiwan, we are enjoying democracy. We have so much freedom. We have freedom of speech and we have freedom of press. And sometimes people complain that we might have a little too much freedom. But for that matter, I should say that we owe the United States tremendously. And I would like to take these opportunities to tell the American folks over here, thank you very much for making Taiwan a democracy. And Taiwan has also been doing quite well economically. We had an economic growth rate of 4.7% last year, and we are going to have 4.5% growth rate for this year. Uh, even though people in Taiwan are still complaining that the economy is terrible, but I think we are growing. And Taiwan's uh, international trade with other countries has also been growing as well. And our trade relations with the United States has been tremendous. For last year, it's 61.2 billion US dollars. And we have a lot of high-tech products coming to the United States. Uh, for example, motherboards, TFT LCDs, and computer chips, digital cameras, and the racing bikes, and all the wonderful food, what all the wonderful products that you enjoy in uh, the United States. And I think we also consume a lot of uh, American products as well. And we enjoy the American products. And we are this 16th trading country in the world, even though Taiwan is very small. But we are the number nine trading partner of the United States. And we are very proud of that. And we are the fifth largest buyer of the American agricultural products. And I think we have all intention to continue on this matter. But I think we will continue to improve in this type of statistics as well so that Taiwan becomes a more important trading partner of the United States. But when we look at the history of Taiwan's economic development, in very early years, Taiwan was very poor. You know, in the 1950s, Taiwan is uh, impoverished, and we need to count down the support from the United States. The American aid is continuing to arrive at Taiwan, and then the United States opened its market to the Taiwan product, and then there was uh, American investment in Taiwan that makes Taiwan developed. And right now, uh, we are enjoying about 17,000 uh, US dollars of per capita income. It's about half of Arkansas. Uh, but, you know, we're doing quite well compared to other East Asian countries. And I should say, because of the US support for Taiwan's economic growth all along, we also owe the United States a word of appreciation. And I want to say this on behalf of the Taiwan government and Taiwan people, that thank you very much for making Taiwan prosperous. And Taiwan is quite secure today, even though we face strong challenges from the other side of the Taiwan Strait. But the challenges did not mean to a devastation in Taiwan because we are in very close 
security cooperation with the United States. After I came over to Washington, D.C., representing Taiwan, I see delegations after delegations of high-level military officials coming from Taiwan, visiting Pentagon for strategic dialogue or for operation dialogues. And I also see many groups of American military experts traveling to Taiwan to help Taiwan sustain its defense capabilities. And we also have plenty of uh, active uh, procurement programs that has been going on at this time. And it is the United States who has been helping Taiwan to be enabled to itself to uh, defend against any kind of aggression intent. And I think it's also in the Taiwan Relations Act that any threat against Taiwan, either embargo or boycott, would constitute a grave concern of the United States. And I think for the matter, I should say that we also owe to the United States that Taiwan can be secure today is because of the U.S. support. And again, I would like to speak on behalf of Taiwan government and Taiwan people that we thank you very much for your support in security area. <laughs> but the main, main topic of today is Taiwan-China Taiwan relations. And I used to uh, handle Taiwan-China relations for three years, uh, serving as the chairman of the Men and Affairs Council. And I can tell you that it was a very difficult job, probably a little less difficult than my current position. Uh, and if anyone who would ask me the current relations between Taiwan and China, and I can tell you that the relations are not pretty, uh, primarily it's because of the military threat coming from the outside of the Taiwan Strait. For one matter alone, China has deployed about 1,000 short-range missiles uh, in five bases uh, in three provinces in Northeast China, in Zhejiang Province, in Jiangxi Province, and in Fujian Province. And they can reach Taiwan in about six to seven minutes. And in addition to the short-range missiles, China has also been deploying intermediate-range missiles and cruise missiles and submarine-launched ballistic missiles. Uh, they, they can uh, target Taiwan and uh, uh, reach Taiwan in very short time. And other than the missile threat, uh, there's also a large number of submarines that has been deployed by the Chinese side that they can uh, attack Taiwan and they can blockade Taiwan Strait. According to the American military experts, it takes only about 12 to 16 submarines to have a successful blockade against the Taiwan Strait. But do you know how many modern submarines China has right now? It's already more than 40 of them. And therefore, they constitute a tremendous amount of threat against Taiwan. And it's not just Taiwan who is feeling that threat. Our mutual ally, Japan, is also feeling the threat as well. And the Chinese behaviors or actions in its submarine activities has also been growing a little bit more aggressive than what we want it to be. They have been cruising around Taiwan's territorial water, and they have been cruising around Japanese territorial water as well. I don't know if some of you must remember what happened last October when Kitty Hawk was having an exercise in the West Pacific. There was a Song class submarine surface up very close to the Kitty Hawks, and that is the type of aggressive behavior that the Chinese submarines have been engaging in. So we have to face those kinds of threats. And therefore, we need to procure a large number of anti-missile systems and anti-submarine systems so that Taiwan can defend itself. And luckily, President Bush promised Taiwan with a robust package of uh, uh, anti-missile systems and uh, anti-submarine capabilities, and we are still in the process of acquiring them. And I think peace and stability in West Pacific it's a key concern not just to Taiwan, but also to the U.S. interests as well. And we would like to work closely with the United States so that peace and stability in the West Pacific can be safeguarded. In the second area that I can uh, tell you that the cross-strait relations or Taiwan-China relations have not been pretty is because of the competition on the international stage. Taiwan has not been under China's jurisdiction ever since 1949. But Taiwan cannot participate in many international activities, including the World Health Organization and the United Nations and the World Organization for Animal Health 
and many other international organizations that many people feel that is the nature or the rights of the people around the world to participate in. And in fact, the situation we face is that the, the matter of international participation for Taiwan is getting more difficult rather than getting easier. You know, for instance, when we tried to participate in the World Health Organization, the Chinese government had this uh, memorandum of understanding with the WHO Secretary in 2005 that specifies that whenever the WHO wants to send any expert to Taiwan or wants to confer any uh, conference uh, related to health that wanted to invite Taiwanese experts to participate in these kinds of events, they would have to get the Chinese approval from the Ministry of Health in Beijing before they can do that. And that is hurting Taiwan's sovereignty. And this is, it is making more difficult for Taiwan to be able to participate in international organizations such as uh, the WHO. And Taiwan, because of its economic situation uh, and its tight relations with other countries, and we want to have FTAs with other countries. We have been negotiating FTA with Japan, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Singapore, and we have been hinting to the U.S. government that we want an FTA with the United States as well, with the background that the United States has concluded FTA negotiations with Peru, Panama, Colombia, and uh, South Korea. But if you look at the uh, market openness, or the labor standard, or the environment standard, Taiwan stands out to be better than any of those countries. And therefore, we think that uh, with Taiwan, is entitled to have a negotiation with the United States for an FTA agreement. But they are not coming. Any of the FTA negotiations with any major economies is not forthcoming. That is because China has been threatening all these countries that if these countries engage in FTA negotiations, there will be negative effect in their relations with China. And therefore, you can see the life for Taiwan's international participation has not been very easy. And those NGO participations has not been a very easy as well. And I can name a few international organizations that Taiwan has had difficulties in participating in or facing the difficulties of having their titles changed. International Hospital Association, International Firefighters Game, uh, Miss Universe Beauty Pageant Contest, or uh, international pitching racing contest, and I think the Chinese government just wanted to change Taiwan's title of participation from Taiwan to Taiwan China, or Taipei China, or Taiwan Province of China, or Taiwan Province of the People's Republic of China. And people in Taiwan just hate that so much, because we are not any part of the People's Republic of China. So in many incidences, our participants ended up pulling off from these international participations. And I think that's not fair for the Taiwan people. And that is one very difficult area that Taiwan has to reckon with all the time. But I think the philosophy of the Taiwan government is not to continue the kind of confrontation on the international stage with China. Because we see no end to that confrontation if the Taiwan government takes on that kind of confrontational mode as well. And we don't like to see any kind of military conflict starts across the Taiwan Strait because that would mean devastation for Taiwan and that would probably mean devastation for parts of China and that's not good for the United States either. And therefore, we have to take active policies in promoting cross-strait exchanges to facilitate cross-strait cooperations and to promote mutual understandings in between the two sides. And I think the best thing that we can do in Taiwan is to welcome the Chinese visitors to have a chance to visit Taiwan. You know, when I was serving as the chairman of the Maine Affairs Council, what I did was to open the door for Chinese visitors to Taiwan for commercial purposes. You know, in the older times, uh, before I took up as the uh, chairman of the Maine Affairs Council, the largest group of the Chinese visitors to Taiwan for commercial purposes was 30. But when I was uh, serving or halfway through my term as a chairman of the Men and Affairs Council, the number is not limited anymore. The largest group when I was still in Taiwan of the Chinese who had a chance to visit Taiwan for commercial purposes 
was 500 of them. They get to see Taiwan, the most beautiful spots of Taiwan, and they get to converse with the regular people in Taiwan on the streets. And they also get to watch our television programs, read our newspapers, because the language is the same. And they like Taiwan very much. And other than those visitors going to Taiwan for commercial purposes, we also try to open the door for Chinese students and scholars for exchange programs. And one thing I was very proud of was trying to open the door for the Chinese tourists to visit Taiwan. And we are having more and more Chinese tourists. And I think even though Chinese tourists like to visit the, those touristy spots, one thing that they enjoy so much in Taiwan is those television talk shows where regular people in Taiwan got, already got fed up. Because those talk shows uh, on television would host politicians from different political parties, and they will be arguing and debating and shouting at each other on television. And sometimes those shouting matches would end up in a fist, fist fightings, and we don't like them. <laughs> but I think the Chinese visitors to Taiwan just enjoy them so much. Because that is something that they don't have in China. And therefore, we think that is proper for the regular Chinese to visit Taiwan, not only able to talk to the regular people on the street, but also get a taste of what the politics in Taiwan is like. And we like that very much. And the Chinese visitors seem to like that very much as well. And therefore, we want to continue to open Taiwan store to the Chinese visitors. And we want to go through the Chinese visitors' eyes to see for their own eyes what Taiwan is like, that the Taiwan is a democratic place, that Taiwan people is friendly, so that they can prove to their fellow Chinese that the Chinese propaganda on Taiwan is wrong. And I think that was one of the steps in creating a ground for mutual understanding and mutual cooperation. But of course, of course the mutual cooperation should start from the government level. And I think one of the accomplishments of the Men and Affairs Council in the past few years is that we started the negotiation of the New Year, New Year charter flight. Uh, for some people who have been to Taiwan and China, and uh, you understand that there is no direct flight or direct regular flight. If you want to fly from Taiwan to China, you probably need to, able, need to stop uh, in Hong Kong or Macau or Tokyo and the waiting time could be two, two hours, three hours, four hours. And it was quite painful in those uh, uh, airports to wait for that long. So we wanted to negotiate with China for direct flight. But the Chinese government did not want to go for the eventual direct regular flights. And therefore, we started the Lunar New Year period charter flight. And in 2005, we were able to get the first charter flight uh, to go between uh, Taipei and Kaohsiung, and three major cities in China. And even though the Chinese government did not want to recognize Taiwan government authorities directly, but we created a private organization called Taipei Airline Associations, which China thinks that it's a private organization. And we have our government officials staff these uh, organizations as advisors or as uh, secretaries, and then they go on to represent the uh, private organizations to negotiate with the Chinese government officials. So the Chinese government will treat these uh, negotiations as private negotiations. But the way we see it is that it's our government officials, and therefore, it's official negotiations. And I think the two sides were both happy about the negotiation, and we were able to have the first direct flight in 2005. And then we move on to negotiate more, for di more direct flight in between each other. And now we have four major festival charter flights. And we also have emergency medical charter flight. And I think we are very glad that the cross-strait negotiations can move on uh, in such kinds of a circumstances that the two sides were not uh, very good toward each other on the international stage. And I think when the two sides, especially the governments, are able to talk to each other more on those uh, substantive issues, I'm sure it will provide more opportunities for two sides to build more mutual trust and I think that's the spirit of Taiwan in handling the crossway policy. We are not about war. We are about peace. And we want to make peace. And we hope the United States can support Taiwan to move forward for those peaceful negotiations. And we want to start on those uh, 
substantive issues, then gradually move on to political issues. And even though for political dialogues it's uh, very difficult in China, uh, for China and Taiwan, because the Chinese government has been insisting on the one China principle, and for them one China principle is that Taiwan is part of the PRC. And for any, any sensible people in Taiwan, we are not a part of the PRC. And therefore, that kind of precondition is a non-starter. And we hope that the Chinese government can drop the one China principle so the political dialogue can take place. And we hope our American friends can encourage the Chinese side to drop the one China principle as a precondition for any kind of a political dialogues. And I think political dialogue is the only way to reach the final peaceful settlement in between Taiwan and China.